que a dívida externa é uma terceira guerra. The foreign debt is World War III. It's a war that does not kill governors. It does not kill soldiers. It's a war that does not kill politicians. It kills innocent people. It kills children. It kills women. It kills the poor people of the planet. A major reason why we are having these problems are the policies which have been pursued for so many years under the advice, the tutelage, and the direction of the World Bank and the IMF. The World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, IMF, are the two most powerful financial institutions in the world. Together, they hold the key to nearly all other sources of money loaned to countries in which over 90% of the planet's population live. In this report, we'll examine the impact of some World Bank and IMF policies on people in three different third world countries. We begin with Ghana. Tema Harbor is more than a civil engineering project. It is the basis for a new industrial age in Ghana. Soon after Ghana achieved independence in 1956, the World Bank began to help this West African country. It lent money to build seaports, roads, and other large-scale projects. This is the huge powerhouse which will eventually be supplying electrical power... The bank's the first major them. loan was for the Volta River Irrigation Project. It included the Volta Dam, then one of the largest in the world. <laughs> The World Bank co-financed the project with a subsidiary of Kaiser International, Valco. Many Ghanaians are convinced the project was of greater benefit to Kaiser and the bank than to their country. One of the Ghanaians is economist Charles Abugre. The electricity for 25 years was controlled by Kaiser International. They paid rates which was less than half the market value of electricity and set up their own industry, which is smeltering bauxite. Meanwhile, Kaiser International had to be paid its loan. The World Bank had to be paid its loan in addition to all the interest rates that have arisen. Until the early 1970s, Ghana was the world's leading producer of cocoa. The money it made from exporting cocoa helped pay off its debt for Tama Harbor, the Volta Dam, and other World Bank-funded projects. This is quite an historic scene, for this is the first cargo of hundreds of tons of cocoa being loaded from Tama Harbor, destined for shipment to various countries all over the world. The bottom fell out of the world cocoa market at the end of the 1960s. Soon, Ghana's economy began to fall apart. By the early 1980s, it was in a shambles. Ghanaian officials knew where to go for help. We went to the World Bank and the IMF in April, or perhaps June of 1983. And we were in, at the bottom of everything that is measured by any economic and social indicators. The bank and the IMF agreed to lend money, but only if the Ghana government signed an agreement to make major economic changes. We had to make choices, either to remain in the squalor, disease and hunger, and rot away completely, or to pull ourselves by our bootstraps. Now, by signing the agreement, eventually it became possible for Western donors to channel in a lot of money in exchange for certain policy decisions. So basically, the World Bank and the IMF were managers of the Ghana economy. They had become more or less the government. And the government followed the agreement to make big economic changes. One change was eliminating subsidies for medicine. With the average villager earning less than $10 a week, that World Bank IMF-backed policy 
makes poor people even poorer. Yes, this one, he used to buy it at uh, 300. You probably... Subsidies had kept the cost of this medicine at a price a poor villager could afford. Health services are better now than before, but because of a uh, high cost of living, most people cannot afford to go to the clinic to take care of themselves. Before, medicines were supplied free, but now you have to pay for them. And most people cannot afford to pay for those drugs. Ghana is 10 years into adjustment, and the growth, the improvement in the economy has not reached the stage that it can support its poor. Meanwhile, the World Bank's own reports reveal that most Africans are worse off today than they were before the bank and IMF became active in that part of the world. How did the World Bank and the IMF become involved in these problems? The World Bank and IMF originated in the rubble of the Second World War. As the war was ending, Europe was in ruins. Its economy and population shattered. At Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, delegates from 44 allied and associate countries arrived for the opening of the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference. The conference created a new world economic order by establishing the World Bank and IMF. Each member nation agreed to put a certain amount of money into the bank and IMF. Each member nation votes on which countries will receive loans and under what terms. Voting power is based on the amount of money invested. With roughly 20% of the investment, the United States has 20% of the vote. Originally, the IMF was set up to provide loans to governments in need of short-term cash. The World Bank was set up to provide long-term loans to governments for large-scale projects. Its first task was to provide loans to help rebuild war-torn Western Europe and Japan. When that mission ended in the 1950s, the bank shifted to third world development. But in the early 1970s, oil money from the Middle East poured into big private banks and problems began. This is what happened. With their vaults overflowing from the oil money, the private banks began to aggressively lend money to third world governments, many of them led by military dictators. Now frequently there are governments uh, which are dictatorships or governments of one vintage or the other, and we must accept that situation as it is. The main objective of the World Bank, however, has been to try to assist the people in trying to have a better life for themselves. The more the private banks loaned, the more they earned from interest on the loans. Profits from foreign operations of the seven largest U.S. banks nearly tripled between 1970 and 1982. But while private bank profits were rising, many third world countries found it harder to pay the interest on their debt, let alone pay back the principal. When they turned to the World Bank and IMF for help, they faced something new, demands for many major economic changes before money would be loaned. The demands include cut government spending. Governments typically do this by privatizing, that is, selling state-owned industries. They also cut spending by laying off government workers, curtailing government services, cutting subsidies for health and education. Another demand, increase the export of raw materials. All of this is to make more money available to help pay off a country's debts. Governments that don't agree to these loan conditions don't get World Bank or IMF loans. And if the World Bank and IMF won't lend money, they know they cannot borrow money from other sources. Here is how these tough economic measures affect ordinary people in Brazil. Rio de Janeiro, a spectacularly beautiful city in a country with a spectacularly ugly problem. Brazil has the largest foreign debt of any third world nation, 
over $120 billion. How do the World Bank and the IMF help Brazil cope with this burden? The fact that we are working with them and helping them, and the fact that at times we provide financing, gives confidence to bankers and to governments to also provide financing uh, to Brazil. So in that sense, we act as a catalyst uh, to help uh, Brazil deal with its external problems. Instead of helping us, the IMF and the World Bank have been sucking resources out of us. The most impressive data is that in the last five years, the IMF uh, took out of, the, of Brazil $4.3 billion more than it uh, loaned to Brazil, it landed to Brazil. So it is a net uh, receiver of resources of this country. Aruda argues this is a result of World Bank and IMF policies that are reshaping the country's economy. This type of reshaping, of restructuring of our economy actually uh, destroyed the internal capacity to produce and to consume. We're actually producing for the international market more and more. Like Brazil's soybean plantations, mainly for export to feed cattle, not people. Aruda sees Brazil caught in an international vice created by the World Bank and IMF. If you uh, have to put your products to the international market at uh, attractive prices, at the same time as all the other countries who produce the same products in the South are being stimulated to do the same, what will happen to the prices of those products? They go down, they collapse, which means we have to always export more to get the same amount back. Because of the reshaping of the Brazilian economy to increase the capacity to produce for exports, much of the land that was in the hands of small uh, landowners or uh, middle landowners was, re was taken by large companies with the purpose of producing for exports. The results of producing for export Profits for exporters, while small landowners like these people become landless squatters in the Amazon. They are clearing the rainforest so they can grow food on the exposed land. When the thin jungle soil gives out in three or four years, they move deeper into the Amazon, repeat the cycle, and help create an epic ecological disaster. Those who don't make a home in the jungle move to cities, where they may be worse off. Is there a connection between people surviving from what they find to eat in garbage dumps and World Bank IMF export policies? One person who sees a direct link is Brazil's Cardinal Arns. The food that we were supposed to eat was being sent to cows and pigs in other countries, and not for women and children here. Our population can no longer starve because of this payment of money that those countries don't need. It's easier to put a camel through the eye of a needle than for a banker to feel sorry for a child that's starving and dying of starvation. But I believe that people can invert this process, and I believe that people can change if they start to become aware of things and become active citizens. Luis Ignacio da Silva, better known as Lula, made foreign debt a central issue in his campaign for president of Brazil in 1989. When I was a candidate for the presidency of Brazil, I would say that if I win this election, we're going to suspend the payment of this foreign debt. We're going to create a fund for development. And it would be applied to noble causes, where one would be able to see each dollar being transformed for the benefit of human beings. 
y un beneficio para un ser humano. Fernando Collar defeated Lula by a narrow margin and was Brazil's president from 1990 through 1992. Collor's promise to pay the foreign debt led to more loans with IMF conditions that benefit the rich at the expense of the poor. Meanwhile, the economy of Brazil continues to deteriorate, and debate on the debt remains a live issue. In the Philippines, canceling foreign debt is the top priority of the Freedom from Debt Coalition. It may be the best organized group in the world focusing on the foreign debt issue. The coalition is a clearinghouse of information and grassroots action on the social and political situation in the Philippines. Head of the coalition is a university professor, Leonor Briones. The situation in the Philippines is worsening. Unemployment is rising. The number of street children is also increasing. The rate of growth is slowing down. We are running out of foreign exchange. A major reason why we are having these problems are the policies which have been pursued for so many years under the advice, the tutelage, and the direction of these two institutions, the World Bank and the IMF. In the Philippines in the past, some good things were done, but also uh, resources were also not very well managed in some other ways. In the case of the Philippines, I wish that they had uh, uh, followed our advice uh, uh, more, uh, more aggressively. Uh, I wish they had uh, uh, opened up their economy uh, and uh, permitted, for example, foreign investment uh, uh, to come in at an earlier time. I have uh, proclaimed martial law. In Before martial law was declared by Ferdinand Marcos in 1972, the Philippines had received $300 million in IMF loans. Vice President George Bush of the United States and his lady have just arrived there. During the next two decades, the bank and IMF funneled over $10 billion into the country. A lot of that money was used by Marcos and his cronies for their pet projects, and some believe for their personal bank accounts. Increasing charges of corruption and abuse of power led to demands for the overthrow of the Marcos regime. You have sown the atmosphere of hatred, of anger, and of revolution. In 1986, a nearly bloodless popular uprising toppled Marcos, who fled to a safe haven in Hawaii, allegedly absconding with billions of dollars in Swiss bank accounts and U.S. real estate. Cory Aquino, his successor, got economic support from the IMF in exchange for promises to repay the loans Marcos had incurred. I am happy to announce to you that we are about to obtain the seal of proper economic housekeeping expected of us by the international community. It has been the consensus uh, within each of those regimes uh, when, when they become democratic societies that uh, they have to deal with the economic realities that, uh, that they are faced with uh, when they come into, into power. Uh, and, and many of them are carrying on, most of them are carrying on and trying to service uh, their external debt, and that is to their credit. There should be a national responsibility to pay for debts which are moral and which benefited us, but it is a national responsibility not to pay for debts which did not benefit us and which were tainted with fraud and corruption. Almost half of the Philippine government's budget is used to pay its debt, now grown to $35 billion. Leonor Briones questions who benefited from this arrangement. If you are talking about benefit uh, to the country, certainly the technocrats benefited, certainly the bureaucrats benefited, certainly the commercial banks benefited, certainly the transnational corporations benefited, but certainly not 
the great masses of the Filipino people whose conditions have worsened steadily and eroded through the years. These diseases like pneumonias are associated with malnutrition. Now you're saying that uh, these people get sick because because of poverty and knowing that they are diseased like this, now the government has the responsibility to, to, to respond to the needs of the Filipino people, especially our children. This is what we're doing to the future generation, to the next generation of, of Filipinos in exchange for the death. Because my parent is only a construction worker, my father. Ah, your father is a construction um, worker. Seeing this school, seeing the situation of these children in very uncomfortable uh, surroundings where there are two classes going on simultaneously, uh, I feel anxiety and fear for what will happen to these millions of school children with their dreams, with their ambitions, which definitely will not be fulfilled if the country insists on giving priority to the deaf and not to their needs. This time I am speaking as a mother of two children and I too am afraid for the future of my children. Some Filipino leaders, past and present, argue that the cutbacks on education and health, no matter how painful, are needed to restore the country's economy. For example, when a patient has fever and you like to reduce the fever, uh, you have to take bitter medicine. And uh, the analogy is very similar to uh, the uh, uh, to this uh, particular situation. If a patient is hemorrhaging and bleeding to death, a good doctor, conscientious doctor, who wants to save the life of the patient should not demand a radical operation. He should see to it that the patient gets stronger first. It's in the same as in the case of death also. The patient, the economy, must recover first before it pays for its blood deaths. I feel a sense of outrage because I think of the millions of Filipinos who don't have housing, who don't have water, who don't have electricity, who don't have drugs to buy for their children when they get sick. Perhaps the most damning indictment of the World Bank and IMF has come from a sister UN organization. In 1987, UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, issued a report. In it, they declared that World Bank and IMF-backed economic changes result in millions of children being sacrificed for the sake of financial stability. The need for economic adjustment within countries is not in question. But policies which lead to rising malnutrition, declining health services, and falling school enrollment are inhuman, unnecessary, and ultimately uneconomic. UNICEF was wrong in that uh, criticism. Uh, and I, I don't think they did uh, the countries uh, that the World Bank and the IMF, uh, we work with uh, a service by uh, presenting uh, that conclusion uh, in that uh, way. But we also see in those countries that have made a major effort to deal with their problems uh, an ability to come out of uh, their economic problems and grow and in that way uh, reduce poverty within their uh, own countries. Every poor child in the developing countries without being guilty of anything is born already owing millions of dollars 
What I think has to be done is that the international economic order has to be changed around. And that's exactly what a coalition of church and grassroots groups is crusading for. The international economic order was changed around at the end of the Second World War with the establishment of the World Bank and IMF. The results in many developing countries have been controversial and led to the charges we examined in this report, charges that World Bank and IMF policies widen the gap between rich and poor. If the bank and IMF do not significantly change their environmental practices as well as their environmental policies, then critics will continue to press for change. If they do not readjust their approach to the poor who have been most affected by their policies that cut back health, education, and social services, then the call to change the international economic order will continue to grow. Do they have any plans of decreasing the payments of our debts? No, they said cut everything except the debts. Do you agree to this? We need to strengthen our voices. We have to make louder protests. We must let them hear that we do not, repeat, we do not want to have more suffering. <laughs>